Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where, where, is, where everyone's from. On behalf of the University of Hong Kong's Center for Comparative and Public Law, I would like to welcome all of you to this virtual book talk event. My name is Julius Yam, and I'm an assistant professor here at the University of Hong Kong, and I'll be chairing this event today. So we are very excited today to be celebrating Professor Paul Daly's new book, Understanding Administrative Law in the Common Law World, published by Oxford University Press. As a public law scholar who is teaching administrative law here this semester, I for one found this book extremely illuminating as well as helpful in helping me understand administrative law cases drawn from a wide range of common law jurisdiction. This is a very ambitious and well-written book and I'm sure will be generating a lot of fruitful discussions within the common law world. We're very grateful to have such an excellent lineup today, and I would like to first do a quick introduction of our speakers. First, we have the author, Professor Paul Daly. Paul is the University Research Chair Professor in Administrative Law and Governance at the University of Ottawa. Paul is an internationally established expert in the field of administrative law. He also maintains the award-winning academic blog, Administrative Law Matters, the first ever blog cited by the Supreme Court of Canada. We also have two distinguished discussions to provide comments on the book. First, we have Professor Jason Varujas. Jason is a professor of law from the University of Melbourne and the co-director of the Center of Comparative Constitutional Studies at Melbourne. He's also an associate fellow of the Center for Public Law at the University of Cambridge. He has published widely in the fields of public law, tort law remedies, and his works has been cited by courts in the UK, Australia, and New Zealand. Finally, we have our very own Cora Chan. Cora is an associate professor here at the University of Hong Kong's Faculty of Law. Cora teaches public law at our faculty here. She is on the General Counsel to the International Society for Public Law, and she also sits on the advisory board of the International Journal of Constitutional Law. So thanks to all the speakers today for agreeing to participate in today's event. Before we begin the discussion, let me outline some housekeeping matters. So we'll begin by having the author, Paul, give a brief 15 minute outline of the book. After his introduction, we'll invite the discussants to speak for around 15 minutes each. The author will then be given an opportunity to respond and engage with the discussants' comments. Finally, we'll invite the audience for questions. Throughout the event, everyone in the audience is free to type in the chat box questions that they would like to ask, and I'll try to raise them in the end during the Q&A session if time allows. Without further ado, Let's welcome Paul to talk about his exciting new work. Thank you very much, uh, Julius, and to uh, all of you at the University of Hong Kong and the Center for uh, putting on this event. It's a uh, it's a great honor. Um, I'm very um, happy also that you've um, lined up uh, two uh, stellar uh, respondents in uh, Professor Ruas and Dr. Chan, um, who are, I'm sure, going to give you a, a rigorous view of um, uh, of uh, this book that I've written. Um, so like uh, you said, I'll talk uh, maybe for about uh, 15 minutes or so, just giving an overview of the book. Uh, this is my uh, stump speech uh, about the book, as it were. Um, and I like to start by telling people why I wrote the book in the first place. And really, there were uh, three reasons, three goals that I wanted to accomplish. Uh, the first is to provide a readable overview of administrative law. Uh, administrative law is a field of study, of academic practice, of teaching, of uh, academic inquiry, um, which is uh, has a bad reputation as being impenetrable and dense. Um, a reputation, in my view, which is not entirely warranted. It's a fascinating subject, and I wanted to provide an entry point for uh, students uh, in particular, uh, but also for practitioners uh, who might be dealing with administrative law uh, on occasion. 
Uh, and anyone really who wants to uh, get a handle on this uh, fascinating and um, uh, poorly renowned subject. Um, secondly, I wanted to account for the, the rapid development in administrative law over the last, say, uh, 50 years. Uh, there's been a great deal of development. Um, and it also it struck me that these developments were being discussed in silos. Uh, people were talking arguing, discussing, litigating about different areas like procedural fairness, like substantive review, like the scope of judicial review in silos. These areas were cut off from others. It seemed to me also that there was a particular, um, a particular set of unifying themes, which actually gave these areas much more commonalities than was commonly uh, commonly assumed. Um, so I wanted to account in, in principled terms uh, for uh, this uh, explosion in the, the subject, particularly since the procedural reforms, both judicial, legislative and regulatory in the mid 20th century, which uh, didn't quite bury the prerogative writs entirely, certiorari, mandamus, and so on, but certainly uh, put us in a position as common lawyers to develop general principles of administrative law much more easily than had been uh, the case before that point. The third reason that I wanted to write the book was to defend the legitimacy of judicial creativity in developing these principles. The where is the judicial warrant for developing these principles? Judges have been very creative. The courts have been very creative in developing these principles, and that raises concerns about legitimacy. Now, I'm very clear from the opening pages of the book that I think this project over the last 50 years or so has been a good project. The principles of administrative law that have developed, that have risen uh, like a phoenix from the, the ashes of the prerogative writs, are, in my view, good principles. They have been, they have proved responsive and dynamic to various challenges that administrative law and the development of govern, government and governance techniques have thrown up over the last several decades. Um, so I uh, wanted to defend the judicial role in creating these principles. And my argument, the core argument in this book is that there is or there can be understood to be an intelligible structure to the body of administrative law, the core principles of administrative law. Uh, and I, in areas like uh, I call institutional structures, so the law, the law relating to bias, uh, delegation, fettering, so on, procedural fairness, substantive review, remedies, restrictions on remedies, the scope of judicial review. I say these diverse areas are held together in an intelligible structure comprised of four values, I call them, individual self-realization. Uh, here, the idea is that courts in developing administrative law and in deciding cases should seek to further individual autonomy and dignity. It, or put very simply, courts should be mindful of the need to allow individuals to plan their affairs, their autonomy, and to be treated with concern and respect by governmental officials, their dignity. The second value is good administration. And here I'm interested in judicial solicitude for effective and efficient use of scarce administrative resources. Thirdly, electoral legitimacy. Many decision makers in the administrative state, such as ministers and municipal politicians, have run electoral gauntlets, and those gauntlets should be respected. When they pass laws, the courts should respect the fact that the laws have been passed or the, the, the regulations or bylaws, as the case may be, um, have been passed by those who have run a democratic gauntlet and have a mandate from some group of the population. 
And lastly, decisional autonomy. Decisional autonomy is the idea that distinct bodies in our constitutional structure should perform distinct roles. And what I set out is an intelligible interpretive framework. I say that administrative law, all these various areas that I've talked about, which heretofore we've thought about in, in silos as isolated areas of legal development, I say that they can be understood by reference to these four values. Now, how does the structure operate? Well, there are two key points in my, uh, in my framework. The first is complementarity. And sometimes the values complement each other and each plays a role in giving administrative law the shape that it has. A good example of this, I would say, is the right to reasons in administrative law. The starting point, as we know, is that there is no general common law duty to give reasons. And we can understand that starting point as sounding in good administration. If all decision makers, great and small, were obliged to give reasons for every decision they render, the hundreds and thousands of decisions rendered every day around the common law world and the administrative state, the machinery of government would simply grind to a halt. So that's our general starting point, and it's a starting point sounding, I say, in good administration. But there are exceptions to that starting point where reasons are required. And these exceptions, I say, uh, can be understood as sounding in the other values. For example, where a decision is particularly important to an individual, reasons have to be given. It's individual self-realization, I say. Where reasons are necessary in order to enable an individual to take advantage of a right of appeal created by statute. There, I say, the value of electoral legitimacy is engaged because if no reasons are given, then the individual cannot take advantage of an appeal created by people who have run an electoral gauntlet. Third major exception is based then in, or can be understood as being based in decisional autonomy. And that is where the courts need reasons in order to perform their role of assessing the rationality, legality, and procedural propriety of an administrative decision. Well, in the area of the right to reasons, I say the general structure of the right to reasons uh, can be understood in terms of these values, which act, act uh, in a complementary fashion. Now, sometimes, however, you will have situations where the values potentially come into conflict. Uh, in those circumstances, I say, uh, a balance is struck between the values. Here, uh, for example, in the area of procedural fairness, if one were to push individual self-realization to its logical limits, one would have trial type procedures before any administrative decision was taken so as to maximize the protection for individual dignity and autonomy. Uh, however, we don't uh, do that. Again, that would impose intolerable burdens on public administration. And so in order to strike a balance between the demands of good administration and the logical limits of individual self-realization, we end up with a system in which an individual is entitled to some kind of hearing, but not full trial type procedures. Now, I should also note that um, the traction of the values or the traction of the structure can vary uh, from area to area. Um, so, for example, when we're talking about the scope of judicial review and to what does uh, the law of judicial review apply, the values there play quite a direct role in influencing how judges decide individual cases. But when we get to something like substantive review, uh, for example, where uh, there's uh, quite a degree of divergence across the common law world, the values play a role at a slightly higher level 
influencing the general structure of the doctrine in the area uh, and not uh, perhaps playing uh, as much a, a direct role as it does in relation to the scope of judicial review. Now, my project is a comparative project. You can tell from my accent that um, I am not from uh, the city of Ottawa, which you can see uh, in its full glories uh, in the, uh, the screen behind me. Um, I'm originally from Ireland, where I did my, uh, my law degree uh, originally. I then studied in the United States, uh, in the United Kingdom, worked as an academic in, in Canada and uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, I have particular familiarity with those jurisdictions and along the way, um, I have uh, also become very familiar with the law of Australia and New Zealand. Um, less so, um, I'm, 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 sorry to, uh, I'm sorry to admit, uh, in respect of jurisdictions like Hong Kong, Singapore, India, and South Africa. Uh, in part, the, the jurisdictions I study are a product of my own expertise, uh, but there is also a significant body of, of literature on these jurisdictions, uh, specifically, uh, individually, and, and sometimes uh, in comparison. Uh, these are the jurisdictions I chose. Um, there's also a question of, of manageability, had I wanted to add uh, Hong Kong and Singapore and South Africa and India, making sure that I was covering all of those jurisdictions adequately, um, it, it, would have, uh, it would have taken many more years for me to uh, reach a stage where I was confident uh, in what I was saying. Um, now, across these jurisdictions, what's studied in the book are what I say are core administrative law principles. And the core principles of institutional structures, procedural fairness, of substantive review, remedies, restrictions on remedies, and the scope of judicial review. The features which I say are, are shared. Now that's obviously at a certain level of abstraction. I'm not accounting for every doctrinal twist and turn everywhere in the common law world. Um, and as I mentioned also, there is a degree of uh, doctrinal heterogeneity, uh, if you like. Uh, all of these areas are not quite created equal uh, as far as the values are concerned, and they have different traction in different areas. Nonetheless, nonetheless, looking at the core principles shared between these jurisdictions, one sees again and again across all of these areas of a vast subject, one sees the values of individual self-realization, good administration, electoral legitimacy, and decisional autonomy operating in a complementary fashion or a balance being struck between them. And we can understand, I say, the law of, of judicial review of administrative action by reference to these four values. Now, on a couple of occasions, I've used what might seem to be a rather tortuous turn of phrase, can be understood as, rather than saying that something is or is not a particular way, I'm saying it can be understood to be a particular way. And that gives you an indication that the framework, the intelligible structure that I set out is uh, interpretive. I'm not describing what the, the law is. I'm not explaining why the law uh, came to be the way it is in causal terms. I'm not developing a fully fledged freestanding normative theory of what courts should do or should be doing, I am setting out an interpretation, an understanding, a framework, a structure which allows us to make sense of this vast area of legal practice, academic inquiry, mesmerizing uh, to students. Um, it is uh, an interpretation, not a description, not an explanation, not a freestanding normative theory. And I'd also say it's a relatively weak form of interpretation. I'm, I'm going to suggest in the next slide that 
my intelligible structure uh, for administrative law composed of four values is normatively attractive, but I wouldn't say it's the only possible uh, normatively attractive uh, framework uh, that is available. Um, I say only that it accounts for the present law of judicial review of administrative action, not making a claim which allows us to say that these four values can explain everything in the historical evolution of the subject. I'm taking the law as it is today, these core principles, and saying that they are uh, united in an intelligible structure uh, by uh, this framework. And nor, finally, is it a unified field theory of administrative law. I've not sought to answer every question. I've not sought to end every debate. Um, I have not sought to provide a roadmap for every judicial decision and the development of every judicial doctrine. Certainly think the values can help a great deal in structuring the law, uh, even going forward, uh, but I am not suggesting that I have achieved anything like a unified field theory of the subject. If anything, my emphasis on a pluralistic approach where there is a multiplicity, a plurality of values, individual self-realization, good administration, electoral legitimacy, and decisional autonomy, uh, it suggests that there is no uh, meta principle or meta value or meta concept which is capable of explaining the vast field of administrative law. So then uh, if we conclude where I began uh, with the aims I had in uh, writing the book, um, what's the value of a values-based project like this one? Well, it's an aid to understanding, which I hope uh, I have achieved. I think it's a principled account of rapid doctrinal change, and I also think it is a normatively attractive framework which protects individuals, facilitates the effective use of scarce resources, which respects democratic mandates, and which allows distinct bodies to perform their functions. It is a framework, an intelligible structure, which is well suited to the demands of a modern liberal democracy in the 21st century. Um, so thank you very much again. I look forward to the discussion with Cora and Jason. Um, you can, uh, I will make sure that you have access to this PowerPoint later on. Um, there are uh, many things that you can, you can read if I've piqued your interest. Um, and I look forward to the discussions today and, and hopefully going forward in the future. Like I say, it's a great honor to have been invited to speak to you and I, um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity. Thank you. Well, thank you, Paul, for this overview of the book. May I now invite Cora first to give her comments. Thank you so much, Julius, and thank you so much, Paul. Um, I would like to begin by congratulating Paul on the publication of this wonderful book, which I've really enjoyed reading, and also to thank Paul and the CCPL for giving me the opportunity of engaging with the book's ideas. In this book, Professor Daly sets out to offer a framework for rationalizing, justifying, and guiding the development of administrative law in numerous liberal common law jurisdictions. The framework is structured around four values that he argues underpin a modern liberal democracy. Um, I'm not gonna repeat what those values are as Paul has already um, succinctly um, summarized what those, introduced those values. Um, what I wanted to point out um, at, at this point is that those values are broadly defined in the book. For example, they cover decisional accuracy, which Paul considers under inter alia, the third value of respecting the roles of elected representatives, and they appear to cover at least um, some institutional considerations. For example, Paul has considered the constraints on judicial resources under the second value of promoting effective and efficient public administration. Paul argues that contemporary administrative law should be understood as a result of complementarity and balance amongst the four values that such a balance justifies administrative law and that the courts should continue to develop administrative law by engaging in this balancing exercise. This is an ambitious project. 
all the more so given the variegated character of administrative law. The book is impressive in its breadth. It covers core features of the judicial review of administrative actions and engages incisively with the case law of five jurisdictions. The persuasiveness of, the, of, of Paul's framework is due in no small part to his thorough grasp of case law with the four values derived from an interpretative study of cases. What will be of particularly lasting value is his pluralist approach, which he distinguishes from monist theories that trace administrative law to a single meta principle, such as the abuse of power or jurisdiction. Some such theories, insofar as they can rationalize the main areas of administrative law, suffer from the pitfall that the master principle that they settle on functions as a conclusory label rather than a method of reasoning. What Paul has managed to do is to elucidate the values at play in the court's reasoning in judicial review. Furthermore, given the influence that the administrative law in the jurisdiction that he covers has exerted on the rest of the common law uh, world, uh, this framework is applicable not just to those jurisdictions, but also to other common law regions. Um, so um, although it doesn't draw on Hong Kong, Singapore, India, South Africa, um, uh, the, the ideas, the framework involving the four values are very much applicable to those regions as well. The book brings a rare order and clarity to a disparate field without sacrificing its nuances and diversity. In what follows, I offer four comments that I think will help readers to better appreciate the utility and limits of Paul's framework. My first comment relates to the fourth value, which Paul phrases as the protection of decisional autonomy. Unlike these three other values, however, protecting the decisional autonomy of the courts or government is not in itself a value. Rather, it's a means by which to achieve other values. For example, maintaining decisional autonomy can enable individual institutions to focus on what they do best and hence lead to more efficient governance, as Paul acknowledges in the book. It can also, as a result of the dispersal of power, lead to the better protection of individual liberty. The question is whether the values achieved by maintaining decisional autonomy are completely reducible to the other three, the three other values in the schema, such that this fourth value is made redundant. I'm not sure, I don't have an answer, but in my view, a more plausible candidate for the fourth candidate would, for, for the fourth value would be checks and balances, a concept that figures prominently in the book's analysis of the fourth value. Um, I don't have an answer to the question of whether the value of checks and balances is reducible to the three other values, but uh, in my view, it, it is at least on, on its face a more plausible candidate for value than is the protection of decision autonomy. My second comment focuses on the relative weight of the four values. The balance amongst the values hinges on uh, the impact of the administrative decision in question upon those values, as well as on the relative weight of the values. For example, requiring the immigration authorities to grant a hearing before they refuse entry of residents may have a considerable impact on efficient governance, but the weight of the consideration of efficient governance may be light compared to that of protecting residents' interests in, in this particular context. Uh, both impact and weight vary with the context and both involve contested normative judgments. In the interest of time, I focus on the issue of weight here. Uh, as Paul um, said in his presentation, he's fully aware that the four values may not have the same traction in every case, and there will be cases in which some values outweigh others, and the relative issue of weights vary across contexts. Um, but the issue of how weights should be assigned to the values doesn't feature in the analysis. Um, all we know is that Paul believes that the courts must assign each value a non-negligible weight. Um, and here I quote um, from the book, um, uh, he argues that we should give each value as much effect as possible without emptying the others of substance altogether. Highlighting that the contested issue of the relative weight of the values plays a crucial role in determining the balance amongst them reveals that in order to show that current administrative law is justified and to meaningfully guide judges, Paul's framework has to be supplemented by at least a theory of how weights should be assigned to the values. 
the recipe provided by the four values alone cannot justify the balance judges have struck between the values. So in the book, when, when Paul endorses certain case law, he's in fact endorsing not just the, the values that may underlie those court decisions, but also the relative weights attached to those values, although he doesn't always fully explain why the weights attached are justified. Um, he does, however, explain why he thinks the weights attached are not justified on at least one occasion in which he disagrees with the court. Um, um, see, for example, his discussion of some aspects of the case of Coughlin. A theory of weights would help to account for divergences in the law across contexts and jurisdictions, as well as the evolution of the law over time. Furthermore, the idea of weight is needed to distinguish the framework as a framework of judicial reasoning, as opposed to, say, legislative or executive reasoning. The four values, as broadly defined by the book, can arguably rationalize not only judicial reasoning, but also legislative and executive reasoning on law and policy on law and policy making as well. For example, the political branches of the government can also be said to be balancing the four values when they make policy. The difference between their reasoning and the reasoning of the courts may lie um, inter alia in the relative weight that they attach to these values by virtue of their different constitutional roles. For example, the courts can be expected to attach greater weight to the protection of individual self-realization by virtue of their role in protecting rights. Um, and moreover, even if the courts cannot completely ignore the value of efficient governance, um, which may be of primary importance to the executive, um, to the courts, the value of efficient governance may be subsidiary to the value of protecting individual interests. So in, in short, um, the values themselves illuminate what connects the law across time, space, and institutions, but a theory of weights is needed to rationalize any divergences therefrom. A third comment follows from this. As it stands, Paul's value of protecting individual self-realization covers the interests of both the applicants in judicial review and third parties. This formulation is unproblematic insofar as the normative interests that the court needs to protect are concerned. But for analytical clarity, it may be desirable to treat the protection of the two sets of interests as separate values. Uh, in judicial review, the courts often have to balance the interests of the applicant against the interests of third parties. If the interests of both are lumped together as a single value, then the court will often have to engage in intra-value balancing, an exercise that may become even more complicated when a consideration of weights enters the stage. For example, the institutional role of the court may call for the court to attach different weights to the value of protecting the applicant's interests and the value of protecting third parties' interests. So um, insofar as providing guidance for the development of administrative law is concerned, it may be desirable to treat protection of the two sets of interests as separate values or to at least foreground the distinction between the two. Finally, my fourth comment um, concerns Paul's argument that the four values are, I quote, not political. They do not represent judges' personal preferences as to how the law ought to evolve, unquote. This remark needs to be unpacked. Given the legal source of the values, um, uh, for, uh, i.e. Paul derives them from the case law, and the values are uncontrovertibly values in a liberal democracy, uh, given the legal source of these values, a court decision to apply them can indeed be said not to be based on personal preferences as to how the law ought to develop. However, the application of these values is often controversial. As Alison Young argues, the specific conception of and relative weights of these values will be contested. Of course, that doesn't mean that judges necessarily make judgments on the conception of the values or the judgment on weights based on their personal preferences. But these judgments are political in the sense that they are judgments on which reasonable minds may differ. To conclude, the book reveals the dynamism, pragmatism, and versatility of administrative law in responding to the imperatives of increasingly complex societies, while anchoring such law in the values of a liberal democracy.
In Paul's hands, administrative law across the liberal common law world is a tapestry woven by the same set of values. What I find particularly valuable from the perspective of a researcher in Hong Kong is that the book enables me to see the affinity of the city's common law administrative law with that in liberal democratic jurisdictions. Affinity not just in doctrine, but in the underlying values as well. Such affinity reveals the relative immunity of Hong Kong's administrative law to the fraught constitutional and political developments in the region in recent years, and hence the potential of this area of law to preserve the liberal status of Hong Kong's legal order, which is a common law legal order that operates within a socialist authoritarian regime. Um, so um, I uh, would like to end by highly recommending the book to all students, researchers, and practitioners in public law. Um, the ideas are sophisticated, but uh, it's written in a highly accessible way. Uh, Paul, you've definitely achieved your purpose of making this a readable um, uh, entry point um, to administrative law and, and of enhancing understanding of administrative law too. So, so everyone who, anyone who wishes to understand this complex uh, field, um, to make sense of this field, and, and in fact, for anyone who wishes to um, understand more about common law um, legal reasoning, um, I would highly um, recommend this book. Um, so uh, congratulations on the publication of this book, um, and I look forward to um, um, further celebrating and, and, and using it in my own work. Thanks very much, Paul. Thank you, Cora. May I now call upon Professor Jason Ferruas. Um, good evening. Um, first, let me thank uh, Julius for his uh, very kind uh, introduction and also thank HKU and the CCPL uh, for the invitation to participate uh, in this discussion. And it's a real pleasure uh, to do so. First, let me congratulate Paul on his uh, book it's a major achievement and contribution to thinking about administrative law and common law systems. It's powerfully argued, and I very much enjoyed reading it and gained a great deal from it. And I'm sure that it will be very widely read and shape people's understandings of administrative law across the common law world. And I echo uh, Cora's endorsement and recommendation uh, to, to purchase uh, the, the work. Now, in my brief remarks today, I'm going to focus on three points. Uh, the first is the benefits of doctrinally grounded theoretical approaches. Second, I'll discuss the book's values-based approach. And third, I'll discuss the use of comparative material. So first, let me commend the book for seeking to offer a sustained account of administrative law in the light of its normative underpinnings. Paul's book is a work of doctrinally grounded theory. That is, he starts from a deep understanding of doctrine. And from that foundation, he builds up a normative framework, which is designed to deepen our understanding of the justifications for the legal norms we have. Uh, such a framework advances knowledge, but it may also hold out the potential uh, for, for guiding and critiquing legal decision-making so as to facilitate legal coherence. In my view, this sort of work is an exemplar of the distinctive sort of contribution that legal scholars can make to the study of law and which is practically useful. It also takes an incredible amount of time, effort and intellect to produce a work such as this. Now production of this sort of scholarship should be at the very heart of the Legal Academy's work. But unfortunately, such work has been in short supply in public law. And part of the reason is a turn to other methods within the public law academy, some of which are questionable. So particularly since Brexit, there has been a rise of ideology where legal scholars give their ideological opinions or react to legal developments based on partisan political commitments. In my view here, legal scholars aren't contributing anything to society that's distinctive. The same contributions could be made by an MP or a think tank. And moreover, these sorts of interventions could undermine the position of the academy as a reliable source of independent expertise. There's also been a turn to very high theory. 
which is incredibly abstract and totally removed from the law as it exists. Such theories are interesting, but they're not particularly helpful and then they and that they don't greatly advance understanding of the law as we find it and nor are they capable of aiding resolution of concrete legal problems. There's also been a turn to empirical and law and context work. Much of this work is extremely valuable, but it does not advance legal understanding in the following sense. It does not adopt an internal perspective, seeking to understand the law according to received legal methods, but rather it adopts an external perspective, seeking to understand how the law operates uh, deploying methods derived from other disciplines, such as sociology. Now, some have, have recently asserted that empirical work can in fact replace doctrinal work, but that's because there's a lack of understanding of what doctrinal work entails. To offer a serious doctrinal account, such as Paul's, requires an articulation of a normative framework for understanding and no regression analysis or rudimentary exercise in case coding can provide that. Now, most recently, there's arisen the curious phenomenon of public law scholarship that has as its aim to stress how complex public law is. Now, these scholars, I think, have glimpsed the rise of high theory and the turn to ideology, and they've reacted like an ostrich, burying their heads in the legal materials. Such scholars consider any sort of abstraction to involve impermissible re reductionism. But the problem is that these approaches do little to advance understanding of the law or offer anything particularly helpful. Everyone knows the law is complex, the proposition is trite, and it does not advance understanding to have the law regurgitated back at you in its full detail. So some of these methods which have grown in prominence have merit and some less so, but none of them can substitute for the sort of contribution that theoretically grounded doctrinal work can make. That is an approach that works from the messiness of doctrine to develop an analytical framework which makes sense of doctrinal rules and principles and deepens our understanding of them by explaining their normative underpinnings. To fully understand a rule, you need to understand the reason for the rule. And if you don't have this deeper understanding, you can't claim a full understanding of the law. Now, importantly, providing such uh, understanding is a contribution the Legal Academy can make that no other group in society is equipped to make. It's a unique, distinctive contribution. Yet such work, as I said, has been rare in public law and our legal understanding is impoverished as a result. So for those reasons, I'm glad Paul has taken up the mantle and I hope his work will inspire others to pursue such scholarship. Now, let me move on to my second set of observations. Doctrinally grounded theory or interpretivism holds out the benefits I've discussed, but there are different types of doctrinally grounded theory. Does the values-based approach articulated in the book realize these benefits maximally in my view, the values-based approach is a very significant contribution that must be taken seriously, but it does suffer drawbacks and thus does not, in my view, fully realize the potential of interpretive methods. So the book, as has been discussed, articulates, articulates four, four values, individual protection, good administration, electoral legitimacy, and decision-making autonomy. And the central claim, uh, is that these values are imminent or embedded across administrative law and recognizing this fact will deepen our understanding of the law. Now, one initial question is, where is the rule of law? Um, which seems like a significant omission, which, which calls for some uh, discussion. Now, secondly, these values are set at a high level of abstraction because they have to do a lot of work. They need to comprehend the vast terrain of administrative law and very thin definitions are adopted for each of these values. That the content of these values is thin enables Paul's to show that these values are imminent across the entirety of administrative law. But this does limit how much the framework is capable of deepening our understanding because the values have such thin normative content, they do not give us as deep an insight 
um, as we might hope. For example, when it comes to individual interests, there's no attempt to articulate a framework for why certain interests are protected, but not others. When it comes to democratic values, no conception of democracy is elaborated, so we have just a general reference to electoral concerns. To know that some conception of electoral legitimacy is imminent in administrative law doctrine does not tell us a great deal. Now, these values, I think, are also common to other areas of the law. I don't think they're unique to administrative law. Tort, constitutional and human rights law could all be explained by reference to these values. And there is a risk that by adopting such overly broad values, one will be able to explain everything, but in another sense, uh, explain nothing. And this leads to a deeper point, that it's not clear how these values provide an account of administrative law specifically. They don't explain why we should treat administrative law as a normatively significant category, because there's no attempt to argue these values are peculiar to administrative law. This seems a big issue if one's aim is to understand administrative law specifically. Further, it's not clear whether and why procedural fairness, substantive review, and legitimate expectations should be treated as normatively significant categories to be analyzed separately, given that on the book's normative framework, they all share the same normatively significant features, that is, the four values imminent in all of those uh, areas. Now, there are also questions uh, of practical utility. So take the chapter on procedural fairness, uh, a, very, a long uh, chapter, 39 pages. In that chapter, I don't recall one sustained critique of the law. For example, that some principle or judgment is incoherent uh, or illegitimate. And the reason is that I think because these values are very broad um, and all encompassing, um, there's really no development that cannot be understood on the basis of these values. And if one can show a development implicates uh, these broad values in some way, which it won't be difficult because they're very broad, then the decision will be coherent according to the analytical framework that governs administrative law and not open to critique on the basis of incoherence or illegitimacy. Now, in this way, I just have a concern that the frame could that the framework could operate as an, an, as an apology for bad decisions, because it could serve to legitimize um, uh, uh, every change in the law. Um, and this is troubling because it seems to destroy any prospect of judicial accountability. There's no concrete benchmark as there would be with a unitary theory against which we can scrutinize decisions and hold judges accountable. And this leads to a linked concern that albeit the book maintains the values framework is useful in guiding legal development, I, 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 I have some reservations about that. Um, the framework sets out four quite broad values and the book favors an approach whereby judges decide on how to develop the law by weighing up these, these values. Now, this doesn't seem to me to provide all that much guidance. Um, rather, it suggests a subjective mode of case-by-case -case adjudication. Uh, according to which it, it seems to me inevitable that different judges will conceptualize values differently, apportion different values, different weight, and strike values differently. Now, chapter eight on legitimate expectations seeks to show that the values framework does provide guidance. But in that chapter, the book articulates one view, and I, I think it's a convincing view, so it's a strong view, one view of how the balances should be struck in legitimate expectations. But a judge may simply take a different view. And we can't say that the judge is wrong or that they've acted illegitimately because the only criterion for legitimacy is that their decision is a product of the values. Now, if we critique their decision, I think they'll turn around and say, you would balance the, the values that way, but I've balanced them this way. Both are legitimate, but I win because I've got judicial power. And we won't have the intellectual resources to offer a response to that. And I think lastly, on the second point, there's a further concern uh, regarding aimlessness. Um, now on a values-based approach, um, uh, everything um, comes down to how the judge weighs the values from one case to the next. It follows that rather than a doctrine such as procedural fairness, 
having a recognized function, such as promoting individual autonomy, the goals of the field are capable of being reconstituted from one case to the next. So in this, I think there are real risks of uncertainty and inconsistency. One case might strongly support individual autonomy, but in the next, the value may be given no weight. And again, we won't have the capacity to critique, or it's, like, it's not apparent to me that we will have the capacity to critique the fact that these decisions strike out in different directions because they can each be said to engage the values. And on the book's account, there is no rule as to which value should be given priority um, or greater weight. So everything is up for grabs. Now, um, I, think, I think I've given, given Paul a lot of hooks there to respond to. So let me, let me move to my last point on, on comparativism, which I, I feel compelled to make some points on comparative law, being a, being a director of a, of a comparative uh, public law center. So the book uh, claims to be a comparative work uh, covering England and Wales, Ireland, New Zealand, Australia, and Canada. And the analysis is certainly enriched by its engagement with a range of jurisdictions. And I think Paul would be one of the few people in the common law world to offer an account um, uh, of, of, of these jurisdictions, which is so accomplished and um, um, uh, uh, it has such a deep understanding of each jurisdiction's um, jurisprudence. Now, I do have some concerns though. So first, I'd, wel I'd welcome an elaboration of the way in which the work is comparative because there isn't a great deal of comparison. Uh, rather, particular cases are picked out from jurisdictions to illustrate given propositions. So it's not the case that there is a systematic treatment of the law of each system and then a comparison of the results. Now, in this connection, there may be some concerns over cherry picking. And I, I don't think it's a systematic concern, but there may be some in certain areas. So there are a few instances where dicta from one judge is picked out from one jurisdiction to make a point but that dictum could not be said to be representative, representative of the local conception of administrative law more generally. Now, second, if the aim of the book is to understand administrative law, then local context matters. As Harlow has argued in criticizing the global administrative law movement, administrative law in each jurisdiction is different because it has been shaped by distinctive local features. Uh, which in turn makes it very difficult to generalize out from any one system. Yet in the book, there is only limited engagement with local context. So in the introduction, there is a very good account of the historical development of administrative law, um, but there is a heavy bias towards the English story, particularly um, in the emphasis placed on the adoption of the unified review procedure in the 1970s. Now, more generally, while there may be some broad similarities between jurisdictions, there are also very significant differences. So some are federal, some devolved, others unitary, parliament sovereign in some, but not others. In some, there's a Supreme Bill of Rights, others a statutory Bill of Rights, and in Australia, no federal Bill of Rights. In some, there's a system of merits tribunal review. In settler states, there are significant issues concerning indigenous peoples. Different conceptions of the judicial role prevail in different jurisdictions. So in each system, administrative law will have been shaped by these fundamental structural features. And to understand the law fully, one must understand those features. Um, now in some systems, such as Canada, I think a value-based account um, may be plausible, right? Um, but in others, there's less of a good fit. So, I, Australian lawyers and judges, in my experience, would seldom engage in values-based reasoning and indeed would positively eschew such reasoning, this reflecting a more general skepticism of big ideas, a focus on statutory interpretation and a strict conception of the judicial role. Now, this is a problem because one of the book's criteria for the success of a theory is that judges would recognize the type of explanation given by the theory. Um, and this reflects a broader point that each jurisdiction is characterized by different language of review. And moreover, there are variations in terms of the law. So the book provides an account of procedural fairness, which places individual dignity at its core, 
but the Australian courts have explicitly adopted an instrumental conception based on the idea of practical um, uh, injustice. Um, and more generally, this is my final point, Brennan's judgment in Quinn uh, eschews, Justice Brennan's judgment in Quinn eschews analysis in terms of individual interests. And that judgment has cast a long shadow. The values-based framework um, uh, accords no built-in priority to any of the four values, but this seems at odds with the logic of Australian administrative law within which individual protection is systematically a low priority. In this connection, there may be a concern that a depiction of Australian administrative law that presents protection of the individual as normatively equal to other values may present the law as more humane than it really is. So I, as I said, I have great uh, admiration um, for Paul's deep knowledge of administrative law across jurisdictions. There are few people uh, who could have written this book and he has woven together the insights from across jurisdictions in a way that is uh, incredibly accomplished. But I wonder if it's possible to do, to do justice to all of the five jurisdictions within the one study. So I better, I better stop there. Thank you. So oh, thank you, Jason. Um, before we open up the floor for questions, maybe I would like to invite Paul for his responses, if that's okay with Pojan. Um, well, well, thank you both uh, very much, uh, Cora and Jason, for those um, very thoughtful and um, reflective remarks. Um, I can't, I, I couldn't hope to, um, to, uh, to reply to, uh, to each of them um, individually, um, but uh, I would start by, um, um, by, by first saying that the, in terms of the, the doctrinal focus, um, I, dis, I, I agree with, with a great deal of what Jason said, um, and it should be, it should be said that, that Jason uh, in particular um, has been someone who has made this sort of work possible and more feasible and more plausible through his development of the public law conference, um, which is now in its uh, fifth iteration, I guess, um, uh, going to be held in Dublin uh, this summer, which brings, it's a, uh, an event which brings together uh, scholars uh, from around uh, the common law world and brings them into to conversation. And in fact, much of um, what ended up in this book uh, began uh, as uh, papers uh, for those conferences. Um, so I think as, as common lawyers, we owe uh, Jason um, in particular um, a debt in, um, in, um, for uh, putting this structure in place. Um, and uh, I indeed, um, I could uh, I, I could say even more um, about um, about uh, the importance of the the public law conference. Um, and um, uh, I, I think it also goes in part to uh, to Cora's point about the the extent to which the um, the, the values based framework I've set out is. Uh, political um, uh, or uh, non-partisan or, or non-ideological, uh, this group of scholars uh, gets together and talks about uh, the law as a an object of doctrinal study, uh, generally in a politically neutral way. And that's not to say that it is necessarily politically neutral or or ideologically neutral, but uh, we have been developing in, in recent uh, over the last decade uh, a community and a, a language um, of uh, doctrinal comparative analysis, which is uh, politically neutral. Um, now uh, the 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 the, con the constant theme uh, of of Cora's remarks and and Jason's uh, focuses uh, mostly I would say on the thinness of uh, the theory that I have set out or, well um, theory sounds a bit grand uh, let's call it a, a framework or or an intelligible structure um, and it is a a, a thin um, it is a thin account um, and that's by design and I'm not. Uh, I'm not. I'm. I'm entirely happy to to wear the label uh, of of thinness. Um, I think the what I would say um, is that a any interpretation, any 
doctrinal um, analysis uh, has to be tested against a set of criteria. And now you can have any set of criteria. Um, you could have the, the set of criteria which is implicit in Jason's remarks, um, which is uh, much more demanding in terms of what it would achieve in terms of concrete guidance to, to judges and to lawyers. You can certainly um, develop, uh, you can certainly have uh, criteria such as that um, for measuring uh, a theory. You could certainly have, um, and I think this is, this is also true of Cora's very astute points about uh, balancing and, and relative weight, um, you, you certainly could develop a set of criteria for measuring uh, a framework uh, which would insist on a high level of, of granular uh, detail. Uh, that's not the, those are not the criteria that I set out. And in, in chapter nine, I measure uh, what I have set out in the preceding chapters against criteria of fit. Uh, how does it fit with the case law? I aim for a high level of fit, and that I say is a is a strength rather than a weakness. That I can account for the law of procedural fairness uh, is uh, in all of its uh, glory, uh, as it were, is a strength. Uh, I would say um, justification is there a uh, is another uh, aspect of, uh, is another aspect that the moral character um, of the the framework its coherence, how it, uh, how it works together, um, and its transparency. Um, and now when we discuss transparency, uh, I'm not sure it necessarily means that the judges have to, uh, have to recognize, um, have to recognize themselves uh, uh, instinctively. Um, I think uh, I'd be entitled to do a little bit of pressing um, of Australian judges. Um, there'd be some back and forth uh, before they would um, uh, that they would necessarily uh, uh, admit um, that, uh, that that what I was saying uh, is a, uh, can be understood to be an accurate account of what they've been doing. Uh, but I'm I'm confident I could prevail in that uh, in that back and forth. Um, but all of this to say, all of this to say, and this goes to my point about the uh, the, the unified uh, field theory. Um, I'm not saying that I've uh, I've answered every uh, every possible question. Um, I think I, I think I do give. Um, um, significant uh, information about what the balancing process might entail, um, but it's true I, that more could be said. It's also true that more could be said about local context. Um, and I do make, I, I, I do caveat uh, in chapter one, I, I do caveat the, uh, the, um, the, the, um, the, the, uh, the scope of, uh, of the argument. And I, I do accept that when a judge has to decide a case, there are many other considerations which uh, may be relevant uh, for the judge other than the values. I mean, um, of course, the constitutional tradition in which the judge is operating is important. Of course, uh, you know, internal doctrinal coherence with other areas uh, of other case law in that particular jurisdiction, that the detail of the case law, um, that's going to be uh, significant as well. Um, so I wouldn't say that the only criterion is that the judges balanced the values and they came to a particular conclusion. I'd say there's there's more to uh, there's more to it than that. And I I wouldn't even I wouldn't even think that um, you know, Jason's uh, taxonomic approach um, to, uh, to to administrative law is uh, necessarily and in all cases. Um, 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 uh, in, uh, incompatible with, uh, with with what I've set out. Uh, it may be that a judge in a particular case um, would um, would take um, um, could, could usefully rely on on Jason's work uh, or Cora's work uh, for that matter, and Cora's accounts of, uh, of balancing um, to, uh, to to render uh, decisions uh, which are um, acceptable. Um, I don't think I want to say much more than that um, at this point. Uh, both Cora and Jason have, have kindly agreed to participate in a, uh, a symposium on the administrative law in the common law world blog, um, for which I, uh, I, I also get a response. Um, so I uh, will be able to, uh, to, to say something more uh, when, I, uh, when I respond. Uh, but let me just say again that the, the comments are, are very 
very valuable. And I think anyone uh, who reads the book uh, would also benefit from uh, the critical analysis that uh, Cora and Jason have uh, have set out. Um, and in particular, uh, whether a thin account um, is a useful account. Um, that's the, the thrust of, of Cora and Jason's comments. Um, and I think uh, if you want to decide for yourself whether or not a thin account is worthwhile. I think uh, the book um, should be read in conjunction with uh, the, uh, the critical comments we've received this evening. Thank you. So thanks to all the speakers for this very rich discussion. Now let us open the floor for discussion. So for, for those in the audience, feel free to type in the chat box, the Q&A box for, for any questions that you might have.